using um, fire response and flood response systems um, to develop the capacity of community first responders to primarily keep them safe and to safeguard uh, their, their camps. Um, so I've got about 25 years of experience of emergency services, primarily in the UK and Europe, but I've also delivered training in South America, um, North and South Africa, and, and lots of the UK and Europe. So that's uh, a little bit about me. Thanks a lot, Paul. Um, so Paul's going to go through a, a presentation. There's quite a few slides, quite a lot of information in the presentation. We do want to encourage people with questions or comments to use either the chat function or the Q&A button. Um, myself and Rasha will be monitoring that throughout the course of the presentation uh, and we'll find the time either during the presentation to address some of them if they're relevant or if there's time at the end um, for a more substantive Q&A session with Paul, we will do that. Um, so without further ado, we have a lot to get through. Um, I think we should start the presentation. Maybe let's do a quick check, Paul, that your internet can see the slide changes. Rasha, can you move to the next slide, please? Perfect. We're, uh, we're all up to speed. Great. On you go, Paul. Great. So um, good morning, everyone. So essentially, the presentation will um, is in three parts. We're going to look at um, why we need to do what we're doing, um, the benefits in what we're doing, and actually where we are already um, with the work that we've been doing since November. So please, um, as Bruce said, feel free to ask any questions that you might have. I hope the internet connection hang holds up and um, let's make a start. So can we have the first slide, please, Russia? So fire safety is it, the issue of fire and displacement settings is not um, is not a new problem that suddenly um, occurred in the last few years. It's been around for decades. It's been around as long as we've created displacement camps, and it's probably one of the few universal risks that all um, refugees and displaced people are exposed to, regardless as to where they are in the world. Um, we can trace through the internet um, fire events right back as far as 2008 that were very well documented in camps in Nepal with Bhutanese residents right up to fire incidents that have happened this year. As we progress and as climate change increases um, and as, as the weather um, gets hotter, we will fully expect fire to become a greater risk to people. Um, a lot of the research that this is based upon has come from wildfires and while we're seeing an increase in wildfires in the States and in uh, Europe and in Africa, so we would expect the same patterns to happen in, um, in displacement camps as conditions for fires grow. Which is why it's important that we take a proactive approach. We don't, you know, all too often we we've taken a reactive approach to fire. We, we've developed a displacement camp and uh, what's happened is a fire has occurred within the camp and then we've reacted to that. There's been a belief for probably too long now that fire is the responsibility of the state actors. Um, whereas it's one of the few areas where we can make a difference and we can empower um, the residents of the camp as first responders and, and they can actually help us to help them. So next slide, please. So since the start of the, the year, these are these are a few locations where major fires have happened in displacement camps. Uh, we've seen fires in Bangladesh. I'm sure everybody is well aware of the major fire in March 21 that destroyed something like 10,000 shelters. We've seen, uh, so we saw a fire in early January in Bangladesh that destroyed around 600 shelters. We've seen, a fire, we've seen fires in Turkey that um, sadly have resulted in the loss of life. We've seen um, an increase in fires in Nigeria. 
this year, primarily as a, as a result of weather conditions. And recently, where I am now, we're seeing, we've seen a lot of fires in the Tongori settlement in Chad. Um, and as a result of the fires that we've seen in, in Tongori, around 80% of the residents have actually left the camp. So, so this is called secondary displacement. Um, and these residents are now in locations where we cannot provide services and we cannot support them. Um, some work has been done by the team here in Chad. And interestingly, 75% of those residents said they would return to the Tongori camp if, if, if there was a process in place to manage the fire risk. So here it's seen as quite a high priority. So we are we're being proactive in, in looking at steps to, to prevent fires and to reduce the effect of them. Next slide, please. So fires, fires are incredibly complex and um, they require complex response mechanisms that, that, that is based around the need for speed because the fires grow very, very quickly from um, a small potentially controllable fire into a large um, expanse of flame very, very quickly. They require the responders to have a certain set of skills that will ultimately keep them safe. So I, I'm, I'm a very big believer in keeping responders safe. We're asking them to do something they wouldn't normally do. Um, so we need to give them as many skills as we can to stay as safe as they can. And actually, we need to give them the right resources to, the, to do the job. So the right tools. Current fire response is based around um, a, a, a conventional approach to a fire stand of some buckets of sand, um, some buckets of water, some fire beaters, uh, maybe a fire extinguisher. It's, it's the wrong tools for the job, especially when the fires develop as quickly as they do. The, the best analogy I can give um, wash colleagues is it's like it's like giving um, wash volunteers a teaspoon and asking them to to dig a drainage canal ultimately the tool will work but I think when you want a major drainage canal dug it's the wrong tool for the job so once we understand the the, the complexity of the fire that we're dealing with we then need to develop the right tools and the right guidance um, that we can give to the, the first responders. And it's no longer a case of one size fits all. So developing um, a single set of guidelines that we can apply globally will not work as we move forward and the fires become more complex. And actually, the, the displacement camps that we construct become more complex as well. We also need to bear in mind the cost of all of this. And, and the actual cost in, in both human lives and the cost of um, the damage caused by fires. Um, we, fires, fires take money away from other projects. So we have to rebuild what we already did. So we have to replace shelters. And actually in terms of human costs, what it does is it compounds the trauma of the displacement. So we need to bear in mind, we focus a lot on psychosocial support after the event. Surely it would be better to mitigate the, the event in the first place. So here's just some figures for you um, about mitigating the risk. Um, and this was from a study in 2015, where the average return on financial investment, when you invest in preparedness, was around 200%. Um, the average dollar cost So the average return on a dollar spent in preparedness was, was $2 um, and the average time saved was one week. So investing in preparedness is the key. So much better to invest in mitigating the solution in the first place rather than actually trying to fix the problem once the kind of force has run out of the stable. Next slide, please. So as we said, so fire is um, 
you know, fire is happening. And, and this is a little graphic that um, Rash has put together, overlaying fires onto displacement sites. So the red dot represents uh, fires that have been detected by a NASA satellite. And the blue dots represent the displacement sites. And, and we should bear in mind that while well, when we look at the original map, there are a lot of red dots. These are only the big fires that could actually be detected by a satellite in the first place. Then there needs to be a certain intensity of fire for that um, satellite to pick it up. So this probably doesn't give us a true and representative picture of all of the fire events that are currently happening in displacement sites. But I think what it does do is highlight the scale of, of the problem that we have to face. Next slide, please. So, as I mentioned earlier, through, because of climate change, we're seeing an increase in conditions where fires can develop quickly. And there's a, there's a very, very simple rule that's used extensively um, by forest services and wildfire practitioners in, um, in America and South Africa and Australia. And it's a rule based on 30, 30, 30. So when the temperature is above 30 degrees centigrade, when the wind speeds exceed 30 kilometers an hour, and when humidity is below 30%, conditions for a fire to develop from a full spark, small spark to a major conflagration are ripe. And as a result, this is when we see the big fires developing. They're driven by wind, they're driven by high temperatures, which has preheated the fuels, and the low humidity exacerbates the flame height. Next slide, please. And again, this is a, this is a map um, showing um, the average daily temperature where the temperature is exceeded 35 degrees with displacement sites overlaid on top. And as you can see, many of the displacement sites in, um, in Africa and moving through into Asia all fall within within this 30, 30, 30 rules. So we would fully expect to see more frequent and larger fires um, as we move forward in time. Next slide, please. So th th that's kind of set the picture a little bit. This is a problem that exists and it is a problem that is potentially only going to keep getting better unless we can get a handle on it. Um, we, over the last three years, um, I've spent a lot of time studying the behavior of fires in displacement camps um, and realize that the current model that we have doesn't always um, fit the purpose. We typically, waiting for the next step, we typically develop this one size fits all approach. We, um, the sphere standards, I think all 300 pages of them, there are 97 words on fire safety. And it focuses very much on site development. So the increase of uh, the prevalence of fire breaks, it focuses very much on the need for, um, uh, it focuses very much on the need for um, buckets of sand, fire beaters, and the need to, um, break down shelters and, and destroy shelters ahead of the fire. So in, in that context, we're actually asking um, first responders, so refugees or displaced people to work ahead of the fire, which I think is which is the most dangerous part of the fire to operate in. Um, an increase in wind will see fire spotting increase, which means elements of burning ash and burning embers will be carried further. So even in camps where we have substantial fire breaks, we would probably expect in the near future to see some of these fire breaks breached with burning embers flying through, through the air and lighting secondary fires. I've touched on the, uh, the equipment mismatch a little bit earlier um and and the fact that the tools that we provide are very rarely the right tools for the job once a fire gets to a certain size 
we um, we then expect the first responders to try their best. And given the fact that these displacement camps are often home to these people for a number of years, they will put themselves in considerable harm's way to protect what little they have. Um, to give you an example, a fire extinguisher where it's provided um, is only efficient um, when it's used around three meters from, um, from the base of the fire. Um, I've stood in front of some of these um, fires in displacement camps, especially in Bangladesh, and I'm sure colleagues from around the world have, have seen the effects of these fires and the heat and the flames that they are produced. And I would hazard a guess that nobody um, on this call would um, would like to stand within three meters of a of a burning displacement camp. The third um, the third thing we have is we have a lack of data and a lack of research on fire safety within displacement settings. It's an area of fire engineering that is gathering momentum, but is still sadly overlooked by many. Um, and I, I've been working hard over the last few months to try and increase the profile of this with a number of professional engineering organizations and fire safety bodies. Um, we, lack a, we, we lack the ability to um, actually gather conclusive data and to compare one location with the other. And as a result, it makes it difficult to plan targeted interventions because a lot of the time we just see the effects of the fire and we, we respond to the effects of the fire by rebuilding what we had and providing um, a, a way of responding to the fire, which then takes us full circle back to the one size fits all approach. Next slide, please. So the, the state of fire safety within, within the, the humanitarian world is improving. Um, in 2023, the global shelter cluster with uh, an NGO called Kindling produced a report, which I think most people have hopefully seen, um, and it recognised that there are two components to fire safety that we as CCCM actors can, can, can deliver on. The first is they recognise that the, the, the body that takes on fire safety should have a coordination mandate, which is something that, that, that we as a, a cluster have, um, and which is something that we need to work within to, to develop uh, fire safety plans. And also we should have community engagement because ultimately we are relying on the, uh, the camp residents as first responders. Um, again, many, while, while typically a lot of people might believe that it's the state responsibility, typically state actors are some considerable distance away from displacement camps and that delays their response times, and, and that ultimately allows the fire to grow even further. As a result, this, the, the fire problem only increases. Next slide, please. So I mentioned um, that, that we are well placed as CCCM to, to engage with this. So we have a mandate for coordination, we have a mandate for to, to develop the site environment and build safety systems. We work closely with the community and we have the, the capacity to develop policies. All of these things are needed to develop a cohesive and comprehensive fire safety solution. So this is not a pipe dream. This is not something that, that we're, we're talking to you about today that we would like to do. This is currently up and running um, in the camps of Cox's Bazaar, where we have developed a fire safety system that supports the, the safety of one point, around 1.2 million displaced people currently. Following a, a major fire in January 2021, which was some months before the, the main fire that most people are aware of. Um, I visited the site of, of this fire in January and recognised that the fire simply burnt itself out um, and approached a number of donors and we were very successful in getting some funding and we 
started on a 30 month project to improve fire fire response within the camps. We work very closely with um, all of the CCTM partners and actors and rather than creating a new group of safety volunteers, we built upon the safety volunteers that were already in place. We utilised the work that CCCM had already done to build strong relationships within the community and built on their capacity. We, 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 we developed their capacity to fight fires. A big part of the, um, of the project was to provide equipment and we recognised that the most effective way to fight these fires was through the use of water, which is a universal firefighting medium. So it's carried in fire trucks all over the world. Um, and we, we developed and designed and manufactured um, a number of pumping systems um, that, 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 that we, we distributed throughout the camp. We provided training to the 3,000 uh, volunteers, uh, which included um, the, um, them actually successfully fighting a fire in a full-size shelter. We, we felt very strongly that the only way we could deliver this training was to um, actually expose the volunteers in a controlled manner to conditions similar to what they would um, experience in a real fire. And um, as a result, over the 30 months, we, we trained over 3,000 volunteers with zero injuries, um, zero damage, and a 100% success rate. Um, the project um, worked equally as well with uh, male and female volunteers and has been carried forward since I, since I left uh, Cox's Bazaar by a, by a local team. I just want to touch on the kind of final point on this slide. And it's the point of integration, and it was um, it was almost an unintended consequence that I had not envisaged when um, when we set this project up. And what we recognised was that um, what we recognised was that the, the 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 fire volunteers uh, became integrated into the host community in terms of response. So IOM and IOM and UNHCR provided um, every single little fire station with a, a, a dumb phone, a mobile phone. And we found that these numbers made their way into the host community. And the host community were then calling the refugee firefighters um, to, um, to, to come and support them because the the, the state actors would take around about an hour to to respond. That's not to say there isn't a place for the state actors and key to the whole thing was to to canvas the support of the fire service and civil defense in Bangladesh and actually get them to accept the volunteers that we had trained as volunteer firefighters within their man system when they arrived. Next slide, please. So where do we go from here? Um, we need to build capacity. We need to, we cannot reduce the risk to zero. So um, th there are lots of, um, there's, there's lots of great work happening in site planning, in fire retardant materials, um, in improved shelters, but we cannot, we cannot reduce the risk to zero. There will always be a need to, uh, to provide a response in some way, shape or form. And again, as I as I mentioned, we expect fires to be, because of the weather conditions, we expect the fires to grow quicker and to expand faster. So the actual ability to respond with the tools that we currently have, such as the buckets of sand and the fire beaters, that time frame is shrinking all the time. So we need to be, we need to build our capacity to respond to bigger fires. We need to understand the risk um, because one size does not fit all. And if we look at good emergency management practice, the first stage of the cycle is understanding risk. 
we need to understand how the fires spread. We need to understand how they start. We need to understand the capacity to respond to these fires. And all of those things will guide us in preparing a contextualized response for each and every development, or sorry, each and every displacement site that, that we are responsible for. And finally, we need coordination in this. We need to share the knowledge that, that we're developing. We need cooperation across all actors, across all sectors. Um, I, I heard a few years ago the, the saying that fire, fire safety is everybody's responsibility, but nobody's. Um, and I think now we're, we're in a very strong position where we're putting our head above the parapet um, we're, we're recognising the need to improve and, and we're taking this forward as, as best as we can so far with the knowledge that we have so far. Next slide, please. So how do we, how do we quantify the risk? Um, so um, I'm just looking at the picture that's on the screen and realising it was one I sent back to Bruce and Rasha yesterday. And you can see quite clearly the risk here in this image. Um, the shelters are typically made of local material. They are highly flammable. Um, and, you know, while, while there's some excellent site planning happened at the Tongori site, what we've also seen in parts of the site that are, that are inhabited is the spaces between the shelters have been infilled by the displaced people building small fences, extending their shelters. So, so while we while we have the best plans um, initially, quite often the, the plans and the designs of this, the sites are morphed once the residents take up um, take up their places. Next slide, please. <laughs> So this is the start of, of the journey. And what we've done is we've looked at how best and how practical we can make this system for, for people on the ground. So we've, we've broken it down into four dimensions. So we believe there are four dimensions that affect fire ignition, fire development and fire spread. And the first section we looked at is the environment. And I want you to please bear in mind that this is the environment conducive to fire. So this is not um, a more traditional approach on, on the environment where we might look at projects to green or to plant um, trees. This is the environment that, that will contribute to a fire. So we've so the first area we looked at was how how safe is the camp environment in terms of fire? How flammable are the shelters, for instance? Um, and we came up with four indicators to assess um, the influence, to assess site setup and, and how fire spreads and develops. The second, um, the second dimension we considered are fuels. And we looked at the fuel loading. So the amount of burnable stuff. Um, and we considered this to be um, quite key in the whole setup. So we looked at not only um, fuels that compose uh, fuels in the traditional sense of the word, maybe like LPG where that's available or diesel where it's used for generators, but we also considered chemicals that might be used by our wash colleagues. And we also considered um, the availability of uh, shelter materials, so such as um, napier grass, um, bamboo, uh, woven matting and tarpaulin. The third dimension we explored was um, human behaviours and we looked at um, practices around cooking and we looked at uh, practices around lighting and heating where that's applicable um, and how these behaviours could contribute to um, ignition. So behaviours primarily focused on ignition, fuels is fairly self-explanatory in terms of 
the the size of the fire. So once you have ignition, the fuels then focus on how big the fire can get, and the environment component essentially focused on how quickly the fire can spread. The final dimension we considered was the capacity to respond, both in terms of the camp residents and also uh, in terms of state actors where they are um, where they are available and they have a capacity to respond. So we've looked at now, we believe the complete cycle in terms of how the fire starts, what there is available for the fire to consume, how the fire, um, how the fire grows, and also the, the capacity to, to respond to that fire, both at a camp level and at a state level. And we're, we're devising this as a, as a series of questions, and the plan is at each stage, once, once somebody in the field has complete, completed uh, the questions and worked through the indicators, we're hoping it will be able to straight away highlight some potential gaps in programming, whether that's around um, behavior modification, around cooking practices, or whether that's a need for an improved response capacity, or whether it's a need to simply reduce the amount of fuel that is stored within the camps. Um, so, you know, there are some key, key benefits straight away that can be achieved from this, um, from this tool, we believe. And again, it will highlight priority areas for target intervention. So at this stage, the risk index is all about providing quick wins. Next slide, please. So when we add all of these scores together, um, we, we end up with a, a, a single number um, and it gives us the site susceptibility index. But it's only, it's only half of the story because, as I mentioned earlier, um, we, we need to consider weather. So our plan is as we move forward to take the, 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 the site susceptibility index and merge that together with, with weather data. And that we then believe will split the index into two, um, two, two very, very good areas. I don't know if we've got the bit in the middle that should be there. So essentially, we're going to look at weather data from a historical point of view, which will potentially give you, um, here we go, a static version of the weather index, which will give you the average days of fire weather and a dynamic version. And we're starting to now provide a tool which can be used at a strategic level um, and at an operational level. If we focus on the operational, the dynamic version um, for, uh, for a minute or two, then and what we can use this tool for is to track the evolution of risk in the coming five days. So in, in the same way that many um, uh, forest areas or bush areas in, in Australia and America have fire danger rating systems, we can implement that system into the camps. And what it might mean is if we know the fire risk is exceptionally high for a period of days, we might need to encourage people not to burn uh, their, their garbage in the streets next door to the, the shelters. We might need to be, uh, dis, you know, display heightened vigilance in terms of cooking practices and tailor fire response plans to this. The static version um, we can use at a much more strategic level so we can identify seasonal variations in fire risk and we can act appropriately. We can understand the, the level of exposure that is there on a, on a, as an average basis and we can use that to, um, to help us advocate for funds and, and to build more complex response plans that involve all actors. So we can, we can share the information. The information should be readily shared with, um, with, with other actors, with other partners, with WASH colleagues, with health colleagues um, and, and everybody else. So, so we, can, we can build a much more complex response plan to what could be a major disaster. So we are better placed to respond. Okay, next slide. 
We also we, we also hope that for the first time we can compare um, we can compare site with site, we can compare region with region, we can compare country with country. Um, because reporting systems currently exist, but there is but they are that they differ country by country and region by region. So in, in using a single coordinated approach, we believe we can have a better comparison um, of, of fire risk. We can gain a greater understanding of trends and we can advocate for capacity to respond. We can create more, more detailed and more appropriate regional contingency and response plans that actually rec that, that are based on the risk and not the perceived risk or, 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 or the belief that we may not encounter a large fire. Next slide, please. So where do we go from here? Um, we're still very much in the early days and we are looking for colleagues to join us on the journey. Um, the, the fire risk indicators are currently out for consultation with a number of country teams. Um, but please, you know, we would like people to join us and be part of that, that reference group. We would like you to um, share any insights and any data that you have. Um, we, we want this to be a tool that is relevant, that will work and that will be used. And the only way we can really do that is to galvanize your inputs um, and, and listen to your experiences and, and build on them. And finally, we're looking for people to pilot the project. Um, I, I'm, I'm currently out in Chad, um, and I've, I'm having some time to kind of implement the, the fire risk index here. Um, so um, we're, we're going to have a number of countries, hopefully in the next few weeks, where we've got some data from. Um, but we will, we will support you as best as we can to pilot the project. Um, we are available um, to do that. Um, and also to then to build on solutions and to build response plans as and when they become relevant and appropriate. So I think that's just about it from me. Um, I've got, got a little bit of time for any questions. I've seen, I, I've kind of been distracted a little bit by the chat, um, but I'm happy to take any questions from, from anybody at this stage. I don't know, Bruce, I think are you and Rash are going to coordinate that. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Um, yeah, if anyone has any questions they would like to, to say at this point, I mean, feel free to, to raise your hands. Uh, there is a, a couple of comments and questions in the uh, in the chat box. Um, someone's giving some feedback on one of the indicators already. I've, I've, I've said that they should join the reference group. But there is a question on the development of solutions for the issue of extreme heat, which I think is one of the you know sort of uh, main issues that people are worried about in the future. Do you want to talk a little bit about possibly the crossover of this work and how it might feed into solutions for extreme heat in the future, Paul? Hang on, can you give me a couple of minutes? I'm just going through the chat because I was was kind of wasn't really focusing on that as I was talking. Hang on. Okay. Well, well, in the meantime, Manuel has his hand up. I might need to unmute Manuel. Hold on. Hello, microphone, Manuel. Thank you, Bruce. Good of you not having given me the mic before. I'm joking. Um, <laughs> no, just to say that congratulations on this work. I think this connection between extreme heat and wildfires in displacement is one of the most proactive perspectives that IOM is bringing from the table. And I think we can do a bit of visibility um, on these. 
within the realm of the climate discussions on adaptation and adaptation on a fragile and uh, complicated uh, contexts. So I would welcome some of the people that are listening that are from missions of particular interest or countries that are on the list of the most vulnerable. Ideally, um, the inform risk index, we can share that uh, because that's what we are using that relates capacity with risk. So lower capacity and higher risk should be the priority. Um, that is an interesting spin on this. But to say that the climate action team is ready when there are one or two countries or three on these to put some financial resources to help you those missions and Paul to create some content that we can give visibility at our pavilion at COP and some of the discussions that we are having now specifically on the loss and damage fund but also on what is transformative adaptation and so these dynamics between extreme heat and the risk of fire human security is very important the, the the offer is made we can discuss and as the budget for the cop support is coming we can discuss what this is eventually even an event at cop to uh, have a dialogue on these and the relations with health it would be very interesting thank you can i just jump in bruce because i found some of the points on on extreme heat and uh, some of them are, 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 are really well put around building materials and um, shelter and stuff like that. And and I think you know there, there's two approaches to fire safety and fire response. Currently, there's a there's a longer term spin that um, our colleagues in shelter sector are are looking at to develop more flame retardant and flame resistant materials. And there's the there's the here and now, which is the need to um, to respond to fires to to prevent material loss. One of the um, one of the interesting um, observations I made yesterday in the camp in in Tongori is while they use CGI as the main roofing material, the the the, the roof is then lined with um, a palm leaf mat, and, and actually it's quite comfortable inside the shelter, but the, the palm leaf mat increases the fire load and the amount of burnable stuff within that shelter. So I think while sometimes we, we solve problems with one solution, we, we operate still, I think, in silos, which is why you know, I, I'm really keen that, that we extend this to as many people as possible. Um, so we work collaboratively to improve fire safety and improve fire response. I'm not sure if that answered the question in regard to extreme heat, but I I, I don't think I could answer the, the technical question at this stage. I hope that's all right. Thank you. Uh, I think Manuel raised his hand. If there's a response to that, Manuel, go ahead. Yeah, no, it's just on the sense that I fully agree with you, Paul, we need to combine these things. The main issue on this is the map that you showed uh, with the black color uh, with the refugee camps overload is the forecast of the International Panel on Climate Change for 2041 to 2061. And the dark colors means more than 100 days of temperatures about 35. And the extreme heat angle that I think we need to bring into the shelter construction, the fire safety, the health services and how to manage this is exactly at this point. Above 35 degrees, there is significant health impacts on uh, the functionality of the body, right? Liver failure, uh, heat, um, heat stroke and others, which means people will also not be able to be outside of their shelters. So the thermal comfort in the shelters will be a critical way to protect people's health against extreme heat, but extreme heat will also aggravate fire risk and the measures to make these shelters better need to be balanced with the fire risk. And if that is not balanceable, then more protection and more measures 
to fight fire if that's the case. So we really need this conversation because this will be the central pillar of what is adaptation in desertic and semi-desertic uh, displacement locations on the future. And if we do not do application of nature-based solutions, reforestation, and a few other measures that allow microclimates to be generated in displacement settings, we will have this tension between these two fields. Exactly, the picture that put, the Bruce put. That dark areas mean more than 100 days a year above 35 on average, and that is catastrophic for the health and the capacity of refugees to even engaging in CCCM if everyone is just dying in their shelters, that's going to be extremely problematic. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Manuel. Um, I think let's move on in the interest of time to a couple of other people with their hands up. Uh, Nicholas, do you want to go? Thanks, Bruce, and thanks, Paul, for the for the presentation. Um, it's a super fascinating topic. Um, I had raised a couple of points in the chat, but just to maybe flag in case you're not aware, and it's something that I'm more than happy to to loop you in on as well. Um, there's been a long running conversation now. It's a work stream with the Center of Excellence on Disaster and Climate Resilience on uh, heat solutions packages. Um, essentially, we're working with a number of chief heat officers in the US as well as Duke University and several other academic institutions um who all have expertise in extreme heat to uh look at different scenarios and try and generate uh solutions packages so there's actually an active uh expert consultation that's going on now until the 10th of uh, may um with lillian watson and some of the colleagues at duke um, i'm more than happy to to loop you in on that and um from my side at least i'm, I'm happy to also join the the reference group if there's scope for that to to also support um, looking at the the fire risk index and and the indicators. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Nick. That's uh, that's well noted. Uh, Shamnaz. Hello. Uh, I wanted to reflect on like the practical aspect of this risk index, because I think uh, community behavior and practices at the IDP sites uh, are really important factor here. Uh, so I think it is very important to understand like what is the community practice in terms of the source of fire. For example, if I, I, I work in Ethiopia at the moment and we have communal kitchens where people do not prefer to cook their coffees there, they prefer to prepare their coffees at their houses and often in a congested setup with the flammable materials, there, there can be a fire breakout. So I think there uh, needs to be something uh, considered as like what is the community behavior that can contribute to the fire risks which can be also a source of fire. I, I think it's a very good idea to have it like a global perspective in terms of climate change and heats and humidity, everything. But these are the couple of factors that I have seen uh, are key reasons for fire breakouts in Ethiopia. Also in Bangladesh, I have worked there. Uh, so there are such uh, reasons behind it. So I think uh, there needs to be a such, such, some sort of indicator for the CCCM practitioners to actually understand what are the fire risks at any given point of time in the IDP sites where people are living, because that will help us to adapt accordingly. And the second part is the response part or the preparedness part, of course. We need to look at like the technical materials, like what are we giving, what are the kind of fire safety measures we're taking. But also we have, uh, I think we need to find a concrete um, concrete way of doing things practically, which is less resource intensive, but uh, much more locally driven, driven with the local solutions. So there can be there can be solutions in the community about how do they uh, cope with the fires and risks in their locality. So these are the two points that I wanted to make. Thank you. So can I just um, can I just add to that? I think um, what one of the things that we need to remember is um, quite often that we we as humanitarian practitioners have brought the materials to build these camps um, into a given location and the um, the the materials themselves are inherently flammable. So, whereas if we look 
um, if we look at kind of traditional firefighting practices in places like um, here in Chad or in Bangladesh, for instance, the, the houses are very well spaced out. And um, as a result, fire um, does not spread particularly efficiently. When we move into a, um, in, into a much denser environment, such as a displacement camp, fires are spreading a lot easier. And, and, and this is the primary reason that, that, that we've seen the major fires develop, is that the small cooking fire, like, like you uh, mentioned, um, has ignited the side of a shelter and very quickly that has developed into a major conflagration um, and then with the complexities of trying to respond to that um, and the the incidence of what we call fire branding which is where burning embers are carried in strong winds um, the, the point that Manuel's been making about the days of um, above 35 degrees we see a preheating of the uh, of the materials um, which makes it easier to ignite. So that's that all contributes to the fire growth. So we actually need to recognize that there are, we, we, what we need to do, like I said in the presentation, is we need to recognize that there are, there is no one size fits all. And we contextualize our approach to each either region or country or potentially individual camp. Great, thanks a lot, Paul. Um, OK, so unless there are any other questions, and please feel free to put your hand up. I think we're coming to the end of the webinar. Maybe just to give people a little bit of an update of what we're, we're currently doing over the next few weeks in terms of the um, fire risk index and what we mean when we say join the, the reference group. So Paul is currently in chat helping um, IOM there up with a response to the fires in Tongori camp. He's also going to be testing the fire risk index on that site. We also have uh, IOM country programs um, committed to helping us fill in the fire risk index for one or two displacement sites in those contexts in Yemen, Ethiopia, and Nigeria over the next couple of weeks. The reference group, what we want from the reference group is essentially to review both the indicators from a sort of technical perspective. So Nick, thank you for your comments in the chat on thermal mass, um, but also from a results perspective, examining some of the results we're gonna be getting from the different countries that are testing them out, making sure that they make sense, that they're comparable across country. Um, but then also we want the reference group to talk about sort of the step five, which is kind of missing in the process at the moment, which is, how do we translate the results of the fire risk index into both actions for, for CCM teams on the ground, right? And what guidance, what training do they need to be able to implement that? How can we make that a streamlined process? Then also, how do we use the results um, at a more global level, policy level for, for advocacy, for more resources um, to address a lot of the issues that have been raised uh, in the webinar? So that's what we're going to be working on for the next couple of months. If you want to be involved, please do reach out to me either uh, to review the indicators, to test the indicators. Um, this isn't just an IOM only initiative. Other agencies and CCM actors are welcome to come on board and help um, with this review and development of the fire risk index. Um, yeah, so please just reach out if you have uh, any further uh, inputs into the process. Uh, maybe time for one last question I see in the chat before we end from Barat Paul. What are the possible measures that CCM can contribute towards reducing temperature and climate adaptation? Maybe that one's more for Manuel, actually, but please. Yeah, that, that's, um, I, I think that's one for Manuel. I think Manuel might have left the webinar. So Barat, we'll reach out to you um, after this and have a conversation about how we can use CCM programming to uh, reduce temperature and climate adaptation. I'm I'm sure it's a it'll be a fascinating conversation. Um, thank you very much for your attendance, everybody. I hope you have a good rest of the day. We will share around the presentation and recording. Um, and if you are interested in getting a copy of the 21 fire risk indicators, please do reach out. We're happy to share them for your feedback. Paul, thank you very much uh, and hope everything goes well uh, the rest of your day in Chad.
thank you so much and again thank you everybody for your time uh, this morning and please feel free to reach out to us.